Good evening, ladies. How are you? I invite you to stand, or if you want to remain seated, it's up to you. Let's just sing praises to our King. You know what's funny? I didn't even plug in. You could probably hear it now. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe. So when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through. i 
There is no other name but the name of Jesus. So, Lord, tonight we just worship you, we praise you, and we adore you. And we ask that you teach us tonight, Lord, from your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hi, everyone. It is so good to see you. Welcome, and welcome back, or welcome if it is your first time joining us. We are so glad that you are here. As you know, we are studying through the book of Judges. And today's a special day as we wrap up our time with Gideon. We began learning about him and taking a, a look at his life before break, which means back in November. Now, I don't know about you, I can't remember anything that happened in November. So I thought rather than giving our entire time here tonight to the chapter that we're on, which is chapter eight, and which you've read and done homework for, and you'll discuss in your, in your group's here we're gonna give and look at a bird's eye view of the life of Gideon. There are 100 verses dedicated to him, which is more than any other judge in the book of Judges. So I hope that as we say goodbye to Gideon and leave our time with him, that we can take with us tonight some specific encouragement as well as heed some warnings. Before we get into his story, however, remember the book of Judges spans several hundreds of years and in that time, we see God's word abandoned, we see him forsaken, and we see the lessons that the children of Israel had learned forgotten. It's been said that the judges were the heroes and the heroines of the faith during a dark and tragic time of Israel's history. And I don't know about you, but that is encouraging to me on so many levels. Of course, as you read what's going on and what's happening with Israel at this time, you're saddened and it's grievous. And yet to see God's provision and his personal involvement of the calling and the equipping of ordinary men and women like Gideon gives us such hope, doesn't it? And may it be so of us that we in this room would be just as ready, just as available to obey and be empowered by God, that we might be some modern day heroines of the faith sitting right here together in this room. But why were these heroes and heroines even needed? Remember, under Joshua, the Israelites broke the ability of the Canaanites to organize resistance. The land was divided and each tribe commanded to clear its own territory of the enemies that were in that land. We read in chapter one of Judges, which we looked at back in October, but we read, the Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. The Benjamites, Benjamites however, did not drive out the Jebusites but Manasseh did not drive out the people, for the Canaanites were determined 
to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites, nor did Asher, neither did Naphtali, and we get the point. Wow, the wisdom of God in demanding that the Canaanites be driven out, that was just demonstrated by what we'll see happens next. And how sad it is, I know it can happen to us as well, that we realize God knew what he was saying. He knew why he commanded us a certain way or directed us a certain way, right? And sometimes we just realize it too late. It's very telling that we may not see the consequence of our disobedience until years later. But while we can't go back and have a redo, we can start tonight acknowledging, Lord, you know best. Your way is best. Your word is true. And help me to seek and fully obey you. Because in chapter 2, we read Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. What a bleak picture. It has been said that Israel's rest and blessing hinged on obedience, and obedience hinged on knowing God the new generation in drifting away from a relationship with God and from knowing him lost their capacity to trust and obey him and rest and blessing was lost as well. But in looking at the life of Gideon today, I hope that we are encouraged that the way his story ends, as we'll see in a bit, does not need to be the way that our story ends. For those who have strayed like Karen said last week, he is able and willing to save to the uttermost, or as she said, the guttermost. And for those desiring to finish the race well, you can be certain that he is able to keep you blameless, regardless of how troubled or how tempted you are. You can be certain of his saving power working in you and his grace extended to you. So it's this twofold lesson. I find in the life of Gideon such powerful encouragement in moving forward with the Lord and yet such sobering warnings that I'm calling what we're looking at today progress and pitfalls. And as we look at this overview of his life, we see Gideon's progress and we also see him fall to some pitfalls just like we see in so many people in the word of God or in present day or even when we look at ourselves in the mirror, there's progress and there's pitfalls. So what can we take away from these lessons tonight? You know, progress is an interesting thing. It speaks of a direction. It is to move forward, even if gradually. There's no timetable and there's no deadline. It's simply a direction. And if we are honest, sometimes we are too caught up or more caught up in the timetable, in the timing, rather than in the direction. We want to see change happen yesterday, and we want to be different right now. But what is so powerful about Gideon's story is that we see what God can do with a person positioned for progress. 
a person whose heart is postured in such a way of moving forward in knowing God more, trusting him more, and obeying him more, even when it's just one small step at a time. Because, let's face it, it is step by step that we are changed, that we overcome, and that we spiritually progress. There's just no other way but step by step. So we first meet Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and check out what kind of state Israel's in and notice what kind of state Gideon is in when God meets him and calls him. We read, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all their sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord, your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Oprah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abizer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So Gideon is doing what he had to do. He's threshing wheat, but in a wine press, meaning in a place that was hidden so that the grain would not be stolen. But this made it so much more difficult. As we read on, we read the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. And we go on to read that Gideon is indeed convinced it's the Lord and he worships him. This interaction here with Gideon has been summarized by some as skepticism. He was skeptical when called a mighty hero or a mighty warrior. He was skeptical over how he would be able to do what the Lord has said and he was skeptical about the Lord being with him. There's a lot we could say about these points, but for our purposes today, it is sufficient to say that as we look at the progress of Gideon moving forward, step by step, even in his skeptical moments, yes, even in his skepticism, God met him. And that's our first point. In his skepticism, God met him. This enabled Gideon to take a step forward, to progress. And ladies, are you just perhaps unsure about something? Unsure about something that you're to do or that you may be called to or the right way to go in a situation? Maybe skeptical of what you thought the Lord had said or what you read in his word about that situation. Will you take heart from Gideon as you turn your heart to God, asking him to meet you, that you may progress to in knowing, trusting, and obeying him? Next, we see Gideon obey 
even if timidly. We see that night the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Here we see Gideon taking a risk by destroying the altar of the pagan gods. If we had continued reading, we would see that the people wanted him to die for it. And isn't obedience often, if not always, risky in one way or another? And yet our second point is in his timidity, God strengthened him. It started with a choice to obey even in the fear that surrounded that choice, he obeyed. Remember when Jill Briscoe was here a few years ago, she had said, courage is fear that says its prayers. Courage is fear that says its prayers. And I'm reminded that sometimes this emotion, the fear or timidity can cause me and maybe you to not take that step forward. It causes me to doubt that I'm even supposed to take that step forward. It can cause us to not progress in our knowledge, trust, or obedience of God. And when that happens for me, I have failed to factor in God. My eyes are more on me than on him. This little ring that I am wearing, it's, I've only had it a couple weeks, so I'm still getting used to it, but it is like a watch that you may wear that monitors all kinds of things. Your sleep and your steps and your heart rate and whatever health things that it monitors. But the other day when I went to look at the information that it gathered, I noticed that at 3 p.m. my heart rate was so super high as high as when I had exercise later in that day. And I kept thinking, what on earth was I doing at 3 p.m.? I could not for the life of me think what I did at that time that caused my heart to race or to be so elevated. And finally, I remembered. And you know what I was doing? I was doing a Bible study, teaching a Bible study. And yet the kicker is I was all by myself. No one was even in the room. I was just recording this thing. And my heart was racing, and I couldn't believe it. And my first thought was, what is wrong with me? Why did I feel like that? And then, I don't know about this time, but usually after the question I ask myself, what's wrong with me, the next question is usually something like, or the next thought, I'm not cut out for this. And then immediately, I thought of Gideon in this situation and how God met him, and how God strengthened him, even in his timidity, and how surely the fact that he obeyed would have pleased God greatly. And ladies, isn't that all that we want, is to please him and to obey him? Can we just let all these other things that sometimes we factor in just fall to the wayside as we turn towards him presenting ourselves to him that we might progress one step at a time knowing that he meets us, knowing that he strengthens us, knowing that he takes whatever it is that we have to give to him, offering of, up of ourselves to him. He will take and he'll use for his glory. So again, we see progress with Gideon, one more step forward. And speaking of Gideon's obedience here, one commentator said, Gideon is now becoming what God said he would be, a mighty man of valor. He's willing to tear down his father's altar. And I love that idea of now becoming. You want to become that godly woman, that loving wife, that patient mom, that woman just exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, you will as you keep walking, as you keep going on with him, he does that work 
but how tempted we are so often to give up right before the breakthrough, right before we're gonna see that outward change that he's been working inwardly in us. Don't stop walking with him out of frustration or impatience. He's doing the work, keep going. As a new believer, it felt so overwhelming and even hopeless to think at times that I would ever grow to the point of the godly women around me. I just had so many areas that needed changed, needing addressed, needing fixed, how I thought it was fixed. And I just remember the realization when it occurred to me, when it, the Lord had revealed it to me really, that he didn't view me as a project to fix, but rather a daughter that he loved. And we see that with Gideon. God not swooping in and just fixing or getting angry, but lovingly meeting him right where he's, he is each step of the way. And does he not do that with us as well? Well, next we see, moving on in his story, we've seen Gideon obey, we've seen him worship, and in the next scene of his life, we see him about to lead his men into a battle which was heavily stacked against them. And we see him seek reassurance that what he was about to do was the right thing. And you know the story when he asks God for a sign, the fleece first, that it would be wet, and then that it would be dry, and God answered those prayers. It's been said that this was a humble questioning of God, more than a testing of him, when taking in the complete context of what preceded it, of his obedience and his worship. So our encouragement here is that God reassures the humble heart. By now we've seen time and again Gideon in his weakness and in his imperfection by the mere fact that his heart was positioned in such a way or postured in such a way that he was willing to listen, to know, grow, trust, obey, that God met him. God showed up, allowing Gideon to progress, to move forward. And how about you? Do you find that sometimes you may limit God or we can limit God by placing too much weight on our human emotions, on our weaknesses or limitations or our struggles, this should be such an encouragement to us. Gideon wasn't perfect, not like David who I just picture sauntering up to the battlefield and just declaring, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? We don't see that with Gideon, but he was positioned for progress, facing forward towards God and maybe most of us can relate more to that, more to a Gideon than a David. So can we choose today to turn toward him, to say, Lord, I don't have it all together, but I want to progress in you. I want to move forward in knowing you more and trusting and obeying you more. The first step is to always turn. It's about direction. Which direction are we facing? And is it towards him? The next scene that we see in his life is chapter seven, where we see the Lord's battle plan and Gideon's execution of it. And no surprise with Gideon's obedience, God proved faithful and victorious. And that's our next point, that with Gideon's obedience, God proved faithful and victorious. And you know, as I was thinking about this chapter seven, I thought how often we wanna start here we see other people in their chapter sevens living victoriously, and we wanna be in a chapter seven ourselves without considering all that it took, all that they went through to get to that chapter seven. Not realizing the chapter six moments of someone's life, the struggles, the working through the timidity, the anxiety, the need for reassurance or doubt, whatever it might be. So let me ask you, will you be faithful if you're in that chapter six season? Will you take the encouragement exemplified by Gideon and keep positioning yourselves knowing that God is gonna meet you there to allow you to take that next step forward, step by step? 
And perhaps you have seen God prove himself faithful time and time again. You know you've received and you're the recipient of his patience and his mercy. You know you're not the finished product, a finished product, because no one is, but you surely are not who you once were. Will you encourage those who are in the chapter six season? And as we go on towards the end of chapter seven to prepare us for chapter eight, we read, then all three groups, Gideon's groups, blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands. And they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places far away. Then Gideon sent for the warriors of Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh, who joined in chasing the army of Midian. Gideon also sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down to attack the Midianites. Cut them off at the shallow crossings of the Jordan River at Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim did as they were told. They captured Oreb and Zeb, the two Midianite commanders, killing Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb, and they continued to chase the Midianites. Afterward, the Israelites brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan River. And now we get to chapter 8, the last scene of Gideon's life, which is just a continuation of what we just read. So let's go on. Then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, Why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you send for us when you first went out to fight the Midianites? And they argued heatedly with Gideon. It's been noted that throughout the Old Testament, Ephraim was the most negative of the 12 tribes, the most likely to complain. What a sad commentary. Here they were, involved in the Lord's victory, and all they can do is complain that they weren't involved sooner. And I think, however, it's something that if not careful, we can fall prey to. And this would be a pitfall for sure. Remember in the beginning I mentioned progress and pitfalls complaining against how the Lord's work is accomplished or against those doing the work of the Lord, that's certainly a pitfall we want to avoid. Rather, I love how Paul describes a fellow servant in the letter he wrote to the Colossians. He called them our beloved co-worker and Christ's faithful servant. Don't you just love that? Beloved co-worker and Christ's faithful servant. How wonderful it would be if that's how we just saw each other and that's it. I'm reminded of uh, many years ago when my youngest son was playing soccer and all the boys were little, but there was one boy who just seemed so much more advanced than all the others. He was really the only one who knew what he was doing, who would run to the right goal even. And one time, and, and there was a boy who specifically always ran to the wrong goal. Like he, he never knew which way he was even going. And in one game, this boy who was head and shoulders above the rest, he got the ball and he's, he's running to score a goal and everyone, the kids and the parents and everyone on the side is just cheering his name, Michael, Michael, Michael. And this little boy who in particular always went the wrong way, who wasn't playing at that time and was on the sidelines, he wasn't shouting, Michael. You know, he was shouting. He was shouting, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. And he was jumping up and down as if he was the one about to score that goal. He was oblivious to the fact he wasn't contributing to the score or to the goal. He just knew what team he was on and what team Michael was on and that it was the same team. And watching him, I thought, Lord, that's exactly how I want to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing we're all on the same team, cheering each other on. We're doing it because we know he's doing it. And don't we long for more of that, especially now? But not only is this a pitfall for the ones complaining, it can be a pitfall for the one on the receiving end of the complaints. How easy it is to get angry or upset or just so greatly discouraged when criticism is launched your way. 
but not so with Gideon. He replied, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't even the leftover grapes of Ephraim's harvest better than the entire crop of my little clan of Abiezer? God gave you victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished compared to that? When the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. Truly, a gentle answer turns away wrath. We've seen Gideon withstand the potential pitfalls within. From chapter 6, the uncertainty, the timidity, that need for reassurance. And here we see him withstand the pitfall from without, the opinion and criticism or complaints of others and all that that can lead to in the heart of the one receiving it. We read, Gideon then crossed the Jordan River with his 300 men, and though exhausted, they continued to chase the enemy. When they reached Sukkoth, which was an Israelite city, Gideon asked the leaders of the town, please give my warriors some food. They're very tired. I'm chasing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. Now, one commentator noted 120,000 Midianites had been killed, but 15,000 were still left. And Gideon and his 300 available men were in pursuit of them, just to paint the picture. So what pitfalls avoided here? Well, burnout, right? They're exhausted, yet pursuing. But the officials of Sukkoth replied, catch Zeba and Zalmunna first, and then we will feed your army. They're saying they don't want to get involved unless the victory is totally sure. So Gideon tried elsewhere for food. Another Israelite city got the same answer. Don't want to get involved unless the victory is sure. Gideon did, in fact, chase them down and capture them. And then he went back to those who denied the aid and taught them a lesson and a very harsh one in that he disciplined them harshly. Some commentators view that this was done in order to maintain the success of the victory that they had just won, and others wonder if it was too harsh. One wrote this. He wrote, the question which the author surely wants us to ask is this, was Gideon dealing more harshly with his fellow Israelites than he should have? Put differently, did Gideon rightly treat his fellow Israelites as though they were his enemies? For me, he wrote, the wonder of it all is the realization that only two chapters and just a few days earlier, Gideon was the one filled with fear who needed confirmation that God would deliver Israel uh, from the Midianites through him. So why is he now so harsh in his dealings with the men of Sukkoth and Penuel? Why does he have no compassion for those who have little faith in his ability to save Israel. These folks did not receive all the confirmation from God that Gideon did. All they see is 300 tired and hungry warriors in pursuit of 15,000 Midianites. What has changed Gideon into such a violent man? And he wrote, he continued this commentator, having dealt harshly with the men of Sukkoth and Penuel, our author now focuses our attention on the two Midianite kings, Ziba and Zalmunna, who sought to escape from the hand of Gideon, but were captured deep in their own territory. Gideon now interrogates these two kings, asking a question that would never have occurred to the reader, to us, coming completely out of the blue. Describe for me the men you killed at Tabor. Where did this come from, he wonders. And if the question catches the reader entirely off guard, the answer is even more amazing. They said they were like you, each one, looked like a king's son. And now for the biggest shock of all, Gideon declares that the men whom they killed at Tabor, the men who looked like the sons of a king, were actually his brothers. Not his fellow Israelites, but his blood brothers, the sons of his mother. And here is something that is entirely new and unexpected by the reader. Something the authors withheld until this moment late in the account. At some point in the not too distant past, these Midianite kings had been responsible for the execution of several men who appeared to them to be of royal blood. Ziba and Zalmunna recognized the resemblance, if not in looks, at least in their demeanor, between the men they killed and Gideon. Gideon now removes any doubt by revealing that the princely men who were killed were indeed his blood brothers, the sons of his mother. 
and we can safely assume that Gideon suspected, if he didn't already know for a fact, that these two kings were responsible for the death of his brothers. This new revelation to the reader explains a great deal. Even though their death was in war, he purposed to avenge his brother's deaths. This might explain why he called in men from other tribes, including Ephraim, to prevent their escape across the Jordan. It would explain why Gideon was intent on pursuing these kings deep into their own territory. And likewise, it would explain why Gideon was so harsh with his fellow Israelites living in Succoth and Penuel. They were hindering him from catching up with those he intended to kill. And it may also explain why Gideon indicated to these kings that had they allowed his brothers to live, he would have let them live. So that's a lot to take in, but there's even more because next we read, then the Israelites said to Gideon, be our ruler, you and your son and your grandson will be our rulers for you've rescued us from Midian. But Gideon replied, I will not rule over you, nor will my son, the Lord will rule over you. And we take a collective sigh of relief and we say, yes, Gideon, but then we continue to read. However, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Orpha, his hometown. But soon, all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. An ephod was the vest-like garment worn by the high priest. So some say this act of Gideon suggests that he took for himself a priestly role, which was to be limited to the family of Aaron. Others say this was never Gideon's intention, and his only mistake was not removing it when he saw the people beginning to worship it. But either way, Gideon's ephod becomes an idol that the Israelites worship. And the chapter concludes, that's the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon, son of Joash, returned home. He had 70 sons born to him, for he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem who gave birth to a son whom, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon died when he was very old, and he was buried in the grave of his father, Joash, at Orpah in the land of the clan of Abiezer. As soon as Gideon died, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal, making Baal Barith their god. They forgot the Lord, their god, who had rescued them from all their enemies surrounding them, nor did they show any loyalty to the family of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, despite all the good he had done for Israel. Remember how Gideon said he would not rule over the people, but rather the Lord would rule over them. Well, the name of his son, Abimelech, means my father is king. It seems, although his words were right, I will not rule over you, the Lord will. But through his actions, what he may have believed did not match entirely with what he said. It's not just what we say that matters, but how we live. How we live is what shows really what we believe, right? He didn't accept becoming a king, but some believe he acted like a king. From the number of wives that he had to the attitude that he had that passed on to his son. And how sobering that is. What a tragedy, what a, a pitfall. Success, victory, peace, prosperity. Did he become big in his own eyes? Did his heart subtly shift away from progressing forward with God? Did it become more focused on self to adapt such an attitude? Remember all we witnessed in his life, all the struggles, yet God was able to and did work with it all as he worked in and through him. But to see his end, 
is very sobering. And all we can, can conclude is, wow, Lord, you're so gracious. You're so patient. You're so willing to meet us where we are. And like Pastor Lloyd said recently regarding Samson, only Samson could bring down Samson. And the final verse of the chapter references all the good he did for Israel. And yet we're left wondering about him. There's some questionable choices he made, some actions of his that we're kind of left with, what? Why? And we can't help but take the warning, that warning, to heart. So what about us? Are we positioned for progress and growth in the Lord? If so, regardless of our weaknesses or failures, we ought to find great encouragement from the example of Gideon, not because of him, but because of his God and your God. But at the same time, are we aware of the pitfalls, of our tendency to slowly but surely, possibly, edge ourselves into the role of king of our heart? Let it not be so. Let us echo Gideon's words, the Lord will rule over you. The Lord will rule over me. And by the grace of God, may we live that out moment by moment, step by step, as we progress in knowing, trusting, and obeying God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much that you give us your word. We thank you for the examples written in your word, God. For men like Gideon, where, Lord, we can see your grace, your patience, your love. And, God, we just present ourselves to you tonight that wherever we may be, wherever we may identify with him, Lord, we say we want to progress. Lord, we humble our hearts and ourselves to you, Lord, and just ask that we would face forward to progress, to move on to know you more, to trust you, and to obey you. Lord, help us beware of the pitfalls. Lord, help us to take heed to the warnings. And God, we pray that we would truly echo those words that, Lord, you are king. You are king of our hearts. You are king of our lives. And Lord, we just wish to serve and worship you. So, Father, we just pray you go before this time now as we break into groups and further discuss and dig into your word. Would you continue to speak to our hearts, Lord? We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, just two quick announcements. If it is your first time here and you do not have a group, you may see Carrie in the back, and she will take care of getting you set up and with a group. And secondly... If you are able to help serve with the coffee, the setup or the teardown, you're able to get here a little bit early, stay a little bit late, not too late, try to wrap that up at a decent time. But would you also see Carrie? We would um, be so blessed if you could serve in that way and would love to, um, to share more about that. Carrie has those details. Thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm.